Tell you I have crabs. My goodness, where is it hiding? There it is. And here we are. I'm almost afraid to ask what you were talking about. That's just <laughs> trying to get back to that photo. Hello, folks. Uh, I uh, Welcome to Musical101.com's I'll Say. I am a musical theater historian and former professional, uh, John Kenrick. <laughs> former professional? And you just former. moved your mic. Hi, I am William J. McKay, equity actor. And today's an easy day because John pretty much runs this one. And I guess just get to sit back and learn all about Carol. <clears throat> Not just Carol, Carol Channing. There are other Carols in this business. There's the wonderful Carol Burnett. I got to work with her. I got to meet her. Um, there are some wonderful Carols, but there's only one, Carol Channing. Um, and you may learn a few things if you're watching this uh, now or uh, in the future on YouTube. Uh, may, a few things that may surprise you about this extraordinary lady. So let's get started with taking a look at her life and her career. She uh, was born shocking. with the name, what? Shocking. Sorry. Yes, she was born with the name that uh, we all know, Carol Elaine Channing, January 31st, 1921 in Seattle, Washington. First surprising thing about Carol is her background. Her father, George, was, now get this combination, German, African-American, and he was a professional journalist. What? Yep. What? Um, wait a minute. This gets better. Her mother, Adelaide Glazer, was German-Jewish. So though both of her parents were German, one of them was German-African-American, and one of them was German-Jewish. I don't care about any of that except for one word. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? And that's in the 1920s when racial attitudes were far murkier than they are today. Uh, the way here's a photo of her with a cousin year, as a child. She said about her racial background, I'm proud as can be. It's one of the great strains in show business. I'm so grateful. My father was a very dignified man and as white as I am. So she um, was, yeah. Yes. I had that quote too. Listen, remember, she's from 1926. Most people would have been, oh, no, the shame of it. And she was never, even long before, a part of that. My father's as white as I am. Meaning, meaning for many years, she did not know that she had black heritage. She did not know. It was not something that her parents mentioned. They spoke of being German. Mom spoke of being Jewish. She was not raised as Jewish. Um, so it was just something mentioned. Uh, I'm sure it helped that not long after Carol was born, a couple of years later, her father took a new job in San Francisco, uh, which even then was a city with a much more open state of mind than a lot of America. Uh, while she was there, she was taken to see her first Broadway musical. It was at the Curran Theater. If you've ever seen the movie All About Eve, that was the movie that they used to film theater interiors. Like when, when Betty, um, you know, when Betty Davis says, you know, mouse, never mouse, if anything, rat. That whole scene where she's arguing with the director and the producer, all playwrights should be dead for 300 years. All right. That was all filmed. Or she's in the lobby. Uh, and George Saunders is telling her, oh, Marilyn Monroe is, is throwing up in the bathroom. You know, that I'm all doing, was done in the Curran Theater in San Francisco. I'm doing well, a lecture was, today with, with Meryl Streep. Go well, on. <laughs> well, that 
in that theater, she saw Irving Berlin's As Thousands Cheer, and the performance that knocked her for a loop was vocalist Ethel Waters. Are you Ethel, going to imitate Ethel too? No, I most certainly do not. <laughs> yeah, very good but Ethel that. Waters not only did the, she played all kinds of characters based on current news events. And here she is in the weather forecast. It, it brought, as thousands cheer, brought a newspaper to life. Uh, and here she is giving the weather forecast. They're having a heat wave, a prop, tropical heat wave. And Carol said that once she saw Ethel Waters in this show, she knew what she wanted to do with her life. Now, of course, she's just a child at this point. Uh, she went to Aptos Junior High School. It looked like a prison. Oh, my God. I thought well, you were going to say, well, what did Carol do next? Oh, my God. Listen, don't a lot of uh, high schools look like prisons? Because, quite frankly, that's what a they, lot they, of them that's are. What they are, yes. Thank you. <laughs> high school was invented by someone out to torture and destroy the souls of young people, certainly of young people of creativity or of anything or, or, or who are nonconformist. Those who will not conform, high school is hell. Uh, it was there that she met and fell in love with the school's band leader, uh, Henry uh, Harry Collegian. Now, Harry Collegian, as you can see here, was a very fine-looking young man. Uh, and he and Carol were very passionate about each other. But she went off to college, uh, and they, they just horrifyingly lost track. But there'll be more on that later. I know. Yes. Now, she attended Bennington College, not Small Potatoes. That's quite a quite a uh, Ivy League school, uh, and it was there that she majored in drama, which was a difficult thing to do at that time. There were very few drama programs, and uh, she, after graduating, she came straight to New York. When she did so, she did what no one in their right mind would do. She had no idea uh, that you needed to be important in order to see somebody important. Um, now, you as an actor today, would you consider the William Morris Agency still to be a heavy hitter? Yes. Yes. Well, back then, it was the brand new William Morris Agency. I have an appointment next week. You No. Uh, and uh, she had no appointment. She walks into their offices yes. in New York City, and she says, I, I, I wish to see Mr. A. Blastfogel. Now, A. Blastfogel is a legend in entertainment. He represented so many stage and screen stars, writers, directors, producers. Um, he was massive. Well, she walked right into his office. Now, if the clip works, if not, I will tell the story for her. But here is uh, Carol in a 1960s or 70s British television show explaining how she auditioned for this man who happened to let her into the office. He just happened to be available. She had very, at Bennington, she had had a very eclectic, shall we say, uh, performing training. Since I was a drama dance major, I naturally hot-footed it to New York to get a job performing. Right. Well, the biggest theatrical booking agency was, and it still is, the William Morris office. So I went straight away there and asked to speak with the president, a Mr. Abe Lastfogel. Wasn't well, he was biting on this cigar, and his secretary sent me on in. And I thought, ah, uh, I swung right into my first number, something I was sure of, because it was a big hit with the girls at Bennington. A simple ancient Gallic dirge in obsolete Vercingetorix French. I remember how Mr. Lastfogel's eyes filled with wonderment. <laughs> Premier, le massacre des enfants et la mère tout le rapiette. Ouche clair bleu regarde qui rejette ton bonte. Ouh, ooh. Well, Mr. Lastfogel thought that I should do one, someone better known than Orestes, like Sophie Tucker's. <laughs> Wait, Mr. Lastfogel, I have another song here. A Haitian corn grinding song. <laughs> rendered by the natives as they stomp Born. out the kernels with their feet. Yes, yes, the bobin got it. What the bobin got it? I'm terrible. Oh, 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 oh,
where Mr. Last Vogel thought he could see some signs of improvement. <laughs> and before he could close the door in my face, I sang it. Give them amul, 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 they grind the land, the zizi, yid, yid, shen, yeh, dor, su. And Mr. Last Vogel said, wait. He said, wait, I think I see a glimmer of talent in this girl. <laughs> he said that his grandmother used to sing songs like this to him when he was a very little boy. And that's how I got into the theater. It was more Jewish sounding than Haitian. No, the the like, first song was Haitian. The, the second song was Haitian. That yes. final thing was Yiddish. Oh, okay. So that's well, something least, his I grandmother a, would have sung to him when he. I was have a good life. ear then. All right, there you do. Don't you love the of a good dance? ear? Gig isn't the gig isn't the hate. You have a good ear. Yes. I was just going to say um, all that training, and she still says dance. Dance. Yeah, well, yes, because that that was just in her her accent. Uh, so she came to New York. So she started in theater. She was in uh, the Cole Porter musical, Let's Face It, 1940, uh, which starred Danny Kaye, but she was only in the ensemble. Her first major role in New York is 1948 in a musical comedy review called Lend an Ear. None of the songs from this show are remembered today. Uh, none of the material. Uh, what's remembered is the man who directed the show. It was Gower Champion, the same Gower Champion who would soon be a major film star with his wife, Marge, dancing. Uh, but he won his first Tony Award at one of the first Tony Awards uh, for directing Lend an Ear. Uh, and it was that show which won the attention of these songwriters, Leo Robin and Julie Stein. Now, Leo Robin was a lyricist, Julie Stein, a composer who already had proven himself in Hollywood. Um, I'm trying to remember the song that he wrote. Um, kiss me once and kiss me twice and kiss me once again. It's been a long, long time. One of the big hits of World War II. Well, uh, he was now working on a book musical, a musical based on Anita Luce's 1920s bestseller, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, all about Lorelai Lee, who was uh, a fictional uh, man-hunting blonde who is out for just one thing, diamonds. Diamonds. Via men, just via diamonds. The men, via the men who can give her those diamonds. Uh, and Carol wound up getting the role. Uh, she was taller than the average woman. She had those huge, you know, uh, you know, T eyes. your eyes. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure where she, we were going. She had that, <laughs> that big mouth and she had that big voice. Uh, and, and, and well, that's why, although she was technically not the big star of the show, just one of the stars, it's she who wound up starring uh, in Hirschfeld's wonderful drawing. And if I remember right, rightly, Carol said it was this drawing that made her a star more than the show did. I doubt that. In this show, she introduced two great songs. I'm Just a Little Girl from Little Rock. And, of course, Diamonds are a Girl's Best Friend. Now, to all you young gays out there who think that Marilyn Monroe introduced this song. Or the younger ones who uh, actually think it was Madonna. Go on. No, no, no. no. Marilyn did not introduce oh, this getting song. another voice oh she God. didn't introduce it she <laughs> get just, a calculator <laughs> she just ruined it uh i'm sorry i can't she didn't abide ruin her. it she had her own touch I, I am one of perhaps five gays in the world who will openly say i don't like marilyn monroe she bores me the ending of her story bores me. The fact that she would sleep with the two Kennedys bores me. Her lousy acting in her movies really bores me. I don't care who she studied with. She sucked. She was no oh, good actress. Oh, at the actress duty. Oh, the with me, but I wasn't there. The performance of her career was in All About Eve because it's also one of the shortest performances of her career. She plays a dumb, blonde bimbo. She didn't have to act, so it was easy. Um, she's not the sharpest pencil in Hollywood's desk, but... I'm Carol didn't pick on her, so I won't either. Uh, back to Carol Channing. Now, people do not know she was married a number of times. First to a writer, Theodore Natish. They were married during World War II. Uh, then in the 1950s, she was married to football player Alex Carson, with whom she had a son, Channing Carson. 
uh, who would prove to be the true lasting love of Carol's life. The two of them utterly adored each other so long as Carol lived, and I'm quite sure Chan still loves her to this day. Good thing they didn't uh, switch to having her last name, because then his name would be Channing Channing. Right, but no, he would eventually change his name. Uh, he would be he would have officially change his name to that of his stepfather, Charles Lowe. Charles Lowe had been connected with the oh, Burns husband and number Alan three. Show. Right. They married in 1956, and this very capable professional walked away from his own career and made Carol his career. Uh, he managed, he 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 supervised everything she did, he was part of it. In later years, when she did Hello, Dolly, he was at practically every single performance to make sure the audience would applaud at the right times and cheer at the right times. He was there to play cheer, literally be cheerleader. In the years following um, uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, she appeared in a few other shows like Wonderful Town. She took over from Roz Russell. Um, she also was in something called The Vamp, which was a huge bomb. And another show but called... But she got nominated for her first Tony Award. Yep. Didn't and there was no. Showgirl. And, and, and nominated Showgirl again. Nominated again, but the show was another bomb. Uh, but she was best known in the 1950s and early 60s for her club act. She toured everywhere. She did the most amazing material. Um, uh, yeah, she had wonderful jokes that she used all over the place. Um, one that she repeated uh, at dinner once... Uh, I was at a benefit that she was also part of, and we had worked together on it and we're at the same table. And that was uh, around the time that Jaja Gabor belted a cop in the mouth and was facing criminal charges. And as everyone was talking about it, Carol put her fork down, finished swallowing what was in her mouth and quoted a line from her 1950s act. You know, I talked about diamonds and I sang about diamonds, but there those Gabor girls are actually doing the work. You got to hand it to them. And all these terribly elegant people sitting at this table at this benefit start spinning up food all over the table because they didn't expect that out of Carol. Um, she was a lot of fun and her club act had some great material. Well, there was a show in the 1950s that she was in no way connected with. Uh, Thornton Wilder, that brilliant playwright behind Our Town, among many other plays. Uh, it was just announced today, by the way. Uh, oh, you know, John, I can't stand you. I was just about to say. I'm go going to gonna say? Gonna, no, you go. Oh, my no, God. Tell me. So good. Tell me. Maybe <laughs> it's different. They're, they're the I think it's the skin of our teeth, correct? Yes. They're going to be doing it at Lincoln Center, although we're not sure how they're going to get rid of the musical that's supposed to be there. But yes, they, they're going to be doing it at Lincoln Center in 2022. John, you're just too good. You really are. It's just disgusting. Go on. I'm sorry. Well, in the 1950s... <laughs> apologize. It's, you're, it's just you be you. In the 1950s, he took a show, uh, The Matchmaker, and made it into one huge comedy hit. And it was all about... Uh, a woman in suburban New York uh, who is literally a matchmaker. She's a widow who, who teams people up. Uh, and uh, the plot was partially borrowed from an 1890s uh, musical that played on Broadway, but I don't know if Thornton Wilder would have known that. He probably did. Well, this play became a huge hit for Ruth. Um, oh, 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 no, no, no. What is her name? Ruth Gordon was the original Dolly Levi, Dolly Gallagher Levi. Uh, and the show it I had a very her in that. I did not know that for some reason. I thought it was Hazel, you know, Shirley Booth. No, uh, but, yeah. Shirley Booth did the movie. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> have you ever seen it? It's a wonderful uh, film. I must have because that's why it's stuck in my head. Is the was reason hard. why the matchmaker is so different is because just like in the musical Hello Dolly, the characters keep interrupting the show to freeze everything, turn and talk to the audience. Almost all of the major characters in Hello, Dolly, at one point or another, talk to the audience. Uh, and that's that makes sense that we're used to that in a musical. But it was very surprising in a play. But making that play into a musical really made sense. And David Merrick, the abominable showman himself. Does he uh, ever smile? Yes, he most when certainly did. Counting when his I money. Met yes. him, he smiled from ear to ear. And I met him toward the end, uh, not really the end, but in the later years of his life. Um, I can tell you that story sometime, some cozy night before the fire. He was the one who wanted to turn uh, 
matchmaker into a musical. And the original title was going to be Damned Exasperating Woman. He got the person who by then was the hottest director in the business. He had now also directed and choreographed uh, Bye Bye Birdie and Carnival. It was Gower Champion. Uh, Now, initially, David Merrick wanted the role of Dolly to go to the woman he had just cast as Gypsy, Ethel Merman. But Merman had burst a blood vessel in her throat during the post-Broadway tour, and she was taking time off to make sure it was fully healed, which, thankfully, it never happened again. Um, so why didn't they the, wait a year? Um, because Bethel the, Merman, she'd be perfect for it. She you would made think. it very clear. She had no intention of doing anything for the foreseeable future. So then they offered it to a couple of other people. Uh, they considered Anne Bancroft, but her singing wasn't quite strong enough. They offered it to my friend, Nanette Fabre, which really blew years later. Nanette Fabre told me that was the st- she felt it was the dumbest thing she ever did was to say no to hello, Dolly. She said every instinct I had said it was a bad idea. Uh, but it was Gower Champion who looked at Merrick and said, look, there's only one person for this role. Get the original Laura Liley. She'll be perfect. So here is Carol at work on Hello, Dolly, with the brilliant Jerry Herman. This was only his second Broadway musical. His first, Milk and Honey, had been a modest but definite hit. Uh, and this show, uh, it opened in Detroit. It had every headache in the world. By the time they were done... Hello, Dolly was a bona fide hit. Uh, David Burns was her original Horace Vandergelder. Uh, rave reviews for both of them. It was extremely popular. And by the way, let me mention this right now. Uh, anyone out there who is watching, uh, please hit like and subscribe so you can see more of this if you like what you're seeing. Also, if you'd like to take part, go into the comment section. Uh, We will respond to questions and comments. Um, So please jump in. We'd love to make this a discussion about the great Carol Channing. Okay, back to Hello, Dolly. This production inspired yet another great drawing by Mr. Hirschfeld. Um, Very famous. Every show that opened on Broadway in in our early life uh, was blessed with the drawings of Hirschfeld for the New York Times. Uh, And here is the one he did of Carol for the original Hello, Dolly. Future revivals of the show used this drawing as their poster. It was that definitive. The show was such a massive hit that the Super Bowl invited Carol to be the first ever star of a Super Bowl halftime show. That is Carol Channing, Dolly herself, uh, thrilling them at the Super Bowl, and they were delighted to have her there. Prince and Carol Channing. What? And Not she together, had of course. no wardrobe malfunctions. Isn't that refreshing? <laughs> no wardrobe malfunctions. She kept everything in the dress. See, it's easy when you're a Thank professional God. and not a slob. Um, yeah, I said it. Um, now, she didn't do much in the way of film because Hollywood... Oh, wait, are we done with Hello, Dolly? I just want to say... Oh, sure. No, I've never done with that Hello, Dolly, because she keeps doing it. Okay. Go ahead. I know this is going to cause you to go, oh, God. <laughs> but I just want to say, it is a, a wonderful show. But act two, after they sing Hello, Dolly, things just kind of, you know, she's stuffing her face with cotton balls and that whole trial scene. And <clears throat> it's not my favorite musical. It's a great part. May I be so blessed as to play the part. I would do it as a guy. <clears throat> but... Just wanted to say you may that. not know this, but not uh, you know, after Carol left the show, David Merrick kept coming up with new dollies. First, it was Ginger Rogers. Um, all uh, of them really good choices, yeah, all were great choices. And, and, some, Ray, and Phyllis Diller, Phyllis like Diller, think, and got you know, great reviews for correct. her performances. It's a great well, part, unless you you can't screw it up. And of course, at you one can, point, they but, really wanted to whiz you know, shvizz things up a little bit. So the idea was they were going to have George Burns play Horace Vandegelder, which would have been very exciting, and have Jack Benny play Dolly in drag. Now, they were open to that idea. But while that was being discussed, it turned out that Pearl Bailey said yes, and they went with the much more exciting idea of an all-black cast, which in the middle of the civil rights activity going on in 1967, electrified ticket buyers, electrified the critics. 
made her huge because she was that good. Oh, yeah. And I saw Pearl when she revived it in 1974. Wow. She was wonderful. as She has a great attitude. But I still don't love the show. Uh, The end of the show. All right. She and Carol became very good friends um, and, and even did a big hit CBS television special together. Now, one of the few great moments in film that Carol enjoys is as the original Muzzy Van Hofsmeer in the movie version of Thoroughly Modern Millie. For raspberries. Which, yes, raspberries, mm-hmm. for which she received an Academy Award nomination uh, for Best and, Feature. And you know Actress. what? Well deserved, too. She really is quite, uh, it's really uh, quite, I can't put my finger on it, but it's very special. It's just very unique um, and, and, and well-earned. Well, notice here, the 1920s look that she had sported in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, she was sporting here. So a few years later, when Julie Stein came to her and said, why don't we revive Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? She said, why don't we update it a bit? And so they turned it into a musical called Lorelei, where uh, Lorelei Lee is sitting there years later at the funeral of her husband, uh, Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, and and she's looking back on the past. This wound up touring the country for almost two years. When it came to Broadway, it lasted 320 performances, which is nothing to sneeze at. And another Tony nomination. Her and fourth. another Tony nomination. Now, that was the first time I saw Carol on stage, and I just loved her. Immediate love. I, mean, I, I got it. When you saw Channing at her best, you really felt that she was there for you in a theater. The now, first, the time, first time, time I saw her was with you. In 1978, when she starred in the, now remember this, this is what people forget. The The 18th revival or whatever. (laughs) The Houston Grand Opera production. Oh. It was the Houston Grand Opera that produced it, so the choral singing was exceptional. Uh, They had all the original choreography and the original sets and costumes. Uh, The show had a healthy run on Broadway and toured for years. Oh, and you and I saw that one, correct? Yep, we saw that we, one. That's the yeah, one. we saw that one. The wonderful Eddie Bracken was her Horace Vandegilder that time around, and he got a Tony nomination for Best Featured Actor in a Musical, but did not win. Uh, not too long after that, Carol appeared on The Love Boat with Ann Miller, Ethel Merman, and their mutual friend, Van Johnson. Van Johnson, you know, was one of the gayest men who ever lived, who had a wife and kid. Uh, and, and, and uh, well, he lived eventually after the wife and kid were disposed of. He lived in an apartment oh, building God. in New York. Well, whenever Carol or Anne or Ethel or any of his other friends would open in a new Broadway show, he, would always, I he just... would always send them the exact same opening night telegram. Have you ever heard about this, Bill? Yeah, no, I'm still reacting to the fact that you've just totally outed him. That he already was, but that he was just the gayest ever. And he disposes on, of his on, children and wife. Van Johnson, all through his movie career, let the public know that he was gay. He mm-hmm. wore red socks. No matter where he went, no matter what he did, he wore red socks. Are you implying the entire baseball team in Boston is gay? No, that was not because he was a Boston Red Sox fan. But Red Sox were an old uh, flag of sexuality. So if someone was walking down the street in the 1930s or 40s and wanted to let someone else walking down the street know, uh, they would simply hitch up their trousers to scratch a leg or something and reveal Red Sox. Red Sox were considered a mark of sexuality. Oh, the things I learn on I'm, our show. <laughs> if you don't believe me, there is. Oh, a little, I do. Yeah. There's, there, when there, it there's, comes to anything about sex, you seem to have the, 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 the score. Not the everything. Point. And believe me, I'm out of date. What I don't know now could fill a book because of the way things have changed. I mean, now, you know, you do it while texting, which oh, is God. hilarious. Well, that's why, you know, that's why some people enjoy gay sex more because, you know, they can be face down and still be texting but moving on joan, River, joan Rivers said years ago back to what we were talking about God so help me van johnson would send the same opening night telegram to all of them love and God, kisses what? on your love and kisses on your opening okay that was what he would always send well God. while she's appearing in this wonderful episode of love boat it really is good uh you should know that she and merman had not spoken to each other in more than two decades here's the story Ethel Merman would never speak to an actress who took over one of her parts. When Angela Lansbury played Gypsy, suddenly Merman wouldn't talk to her. 
and they'd known each other for years. Out of nowhere, Merman won't talk to her. You took my part. What? She wouldn't talk to Rosalind Russell. Surprise, surprise. I can't blame her there. Um, but there, there were people she would not talk to. And suddenly, as soon as... They were probably Carol, all the better for it. Well, as soon as Carol did Hello, Dolly, Ethel would cut her dead. They'd be at a party or in, in one of the major... You know, they'd be in Sardis. Oh, Ethel, how are you? Boom. Not even there. She would just move on. She would... On closing... Now, remember, remember eventually, Merman plays the role of Dolly. She was the last one in the original run on Broadway, 1969-70. And uh, closing night, they wanted her to pose with Carol Channing. Carol Channing walked up to the door of Ethel's dressing room. Ethel said, oh, I knew you'd be here tonight, Carol, and slammed the door in Carol's face. Well, at least he talked to her. <laughs> Without looking at her. Without oh, even looking at her. What Carol did not know until after that night was that originally the show had been intended for Merman. And even though she hadn't played it first, she thought of it as her show. I'm wondering if she also cut all those other performers did. I never got to ask Pearl Bailey, honey. So she never told me. But uh, so Carol hasn't talked to her in years. She's in Los Angeles to film this, to tape this show. And she gets in the limo that's driving her to rehearsals. And she says, are we picking up anyone else? Why, yes, Miss Ch Channing, we're going to be picking up Miss Merman. And so she said, oh, dear, I figured I might hide behind my newspaper. This is from Carol's wonderful autobiography. If you have not read it, just lucky I guess. And yeah, this did you is, write it? Uh, huh? Did you write it? No, I wish. Uh, it, the thing, of course, is, it is her autobiography. It is so. so I'm I'm sure she had someone helping, but it is so. It is a little eclectic. It's it's it goes all off in directions. Yes, well, you you have time, to. Which is why I suspect it really is Carol's work primarily, because that's what a conversation with Carol could be like. Carol could be all across the flow. Well, she says how, you know, she got into, uh, she said, well, out came Ethel into the bright California sunshine, looking oddly like Harold Langdon, the silent film star. She got into the back seat with me and yelled, hi, Carol. Oh, good. She's talking to me. Ethel, I had the strangest plane trip out here. A passenger was bleeding from the rectum. Now, that's the first thing she said to me since 1964. Uh, anyway, I repeated, a passenger was bleeding from the rectum? Yeah. I said, what you would have said. How did you know? Well, there was no doctor on the plane, but I'm a nurse. What the hell are you laughing at? I'm a good nurse. I volunteer to serve at Roosevelt Hospital every Thursday. To which Carol writes, now I ask you, if you were strung up in Roosevelt Hospital, wouldn't you dread Thursdays? <laughs> I mean, this woman walks into your room with her little white nurse's band over her head and screams, I'm your nurse. Roll the <laughs> hell over. Well, back to the plane. She said to the bleeding gentleman, I'm a nurse. Take down your pants. What did you have for dinner? Mexican. I don't think that would cause this. I well, diagnosed this case as what he did. <laughs> I diagnosed this case as diverticulosis. I interrupted her. Ethel, I know because Lynn Fontan had it. She said it was diverticulitis. Ethel gave a beat. That's the singular. <laughs> you mean this was a multiple case? <laughs> So they go about doing their rehearsals. Uh, and On the plane? Times. You're off the plane now. We're back You're off the, the plane. Okay, uh, back. She's back in the limo with Carol. All right. They get to the studio. And over the next few days, Ethel Can't you picture nice. them rehearsing over the man with the bleeding anus? No, no. So right. Just... <laughs> they're, they're rehearsing. And she, she says something that she says she's never admitted before. Uh, whenever, uh, whenever the moment the man, the moment the man snopped, snaps those two wooden sticks together and says, action, I sweat. Uh, the director, cut, powder down, Miss Channing. While makeup was powdering, I said, how come, to Ann Miller and Ethel Merman, how come you two girls are so dainty and feminine and I sweat like a truck driver? Annie never wants you to feel badly about yourself, so she consoled me. Don't you worry, honey. Everybody sweats, but in a different place. You sweat in the face. Some sweat in the pits. I sweat in the crotch. 
the last sentence received attention from lighting men, cameramen, and makeup staff. Uh, we missed that. What did she say? <laughs> <laughs> Ethel didn't care for the attention Annie Miller was getting, so she pierced the atmosphere with, Show every woman sweats from the crotch. <laughs> Aha, attention. Class with a capital K. <laughs> Aha, attention. Now louder. Everybody sweats in the, my hand covered Ethel's mouth. <laughs> Ethel, we heard you. In the first place, you don't know. <laughs> you haven't asked anyone. <laughs> Uh, have you asked anyone? It may not be true. Ethel, pulling my hand away. Everybody sweats in. I had to swing my hand on her mouth again and keep it there. And Annie called out, Oh, yes, and sugar babies between scenes? My little blow dryer was just about worn out. This sort of talk went on with none of it in the final show. But that, that's, that, that is so Carol in that story. And it's so Ethel. It just fits the two of them perfectly. It's a great chapter in the book and uh, turning the tone a little bit. She talks about being at uh, her, at Ethel's uh, deathbed, which is quite lovely. So it's a really lovely, it's a great chapter. John had said, make sure you read that chapter. And no, I went, make, okay, make sure you're I read it. The book. This is a great, I think it really tells you a lot about Carol. If you want to learn about her, read her autobiography. Well, in 1996, she made her final national tour and appearance on Broadway in one more revival of Hello, Dolly. And frankly, she was still in awesome shape. She was great in this production. Uh, it was not too long afterward uh, that she discovered that, um, well, her husband, uh, her husband, Charles Lowe, had suffered a stroke. And while he was in the hospital, uh, she had attorneys and, and, uh, uh, accountants come in to try to figure out how he was running things and found out that among other things he had been when when she was not getting uh, fan mail, he would hire people people to write her fan letters. That's not an evil thing, but things like that bugged her because he hadn't told her. So she began divorce proceedings. Some lawyer stuck his forked tongue in her ear. You know the classic joke, don't you, Bill? Uh, what is 1500 lawyers dead at the bottom of the ocean? A good idea. A good start. Oh, okay. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, and and this lawyer convinced her. You and got we've just lost all our lawyers who are listening to. You've him. got to divorce him. You've got to divorce him. Um, and so while the divorce proceedings were being initiated, uh, he passed away. So she was technically his widow. Well, very wasn't soon, there a rumor about uh, another rumor that Charles was gay? Yes. Wasn't there that too? There was a rumor, but he never made any passes at me. I'll tell you that much. And I knew them. Um, um, you know, you know, I think that people who watch this thing, the millions that are listening must sit there and go, well, he must've set that line up for John. No yeah. audience members. Yeah. I did not. I had no idea. They knew each other. Uh, you will see here that your friend, Mr. G says that was great visual effects for the story. Glad you enjoyed them. Mr. G. Um, now let's carry on. Uh, well, I didn't even know. <laughs> so in the early 2000s, Carol was doing her one woman show again and touring around the country with it. And who should come to see her in it, but her high school sweetheart, Harry Collegian. They met, they sparked again, and they were married in 2003. Just in case some of you didn't notice, this is the guy in the very beginning of our show who they were, you know, we had that picture yeah. of them in high school. Her yes. high school sweetheart. Uh, and until his death a few years later, they remained devoted to each other. While they were together, she did uh, benefits all around the country, including several that she and I worked on. Believe oh, God, you didn't or, sleep with her, did you? No, heavens no. Okay, uh, so sure. you, th th it is hard to believe, but that's me in that side of the photo uh, next to Carol. And there she is being the sweetheart that she always was with people. Working on an event with Carol Channing was always such fun. No matter how well you knew her, uh, when the phone rang, and, and I've heard this from people who were her close personal friends, you, she could be calling you for the, ten, for the second time or for the two millionth time. And it would always be, hello, this is Carol, Carol Channing. Like there'd be anyone else who talked like that. You knew the voice the minute you heard it. She was such a joy to work with. She knew how to thrill audiences. She always delivered. Now we mentioned her son Channing uh, 
well, Channing, Channing, yes, Channing right. Low. Well, <laughs> Chan Low, and he goes now by the professional name of Chan Low. He is a professional political. Is that politician. Lassie's mom in the background there? Uh, yes, that is. Okay. It actually, very, very, very good catch. Thank but you. There, here he is with Carol not too I'm many years old. ago. Chan Lo is a very successful political cartoonist. He's syndicated in many major publications. Uh, like his mom, he is a good liberal Democrat uh, and has he definitely had fun during the Trump years. A couple of years ago when it was announced uh, that Hello, Dolly would be revived on Broadway starring a Bette Midler. Carol said, bring, get on over here. Let's take some photos, help promote this thing. She was thrilled that Dolly was going to be done again, especially by someone who had been a newcomer to Broadway back when Carol was starring in Dolly. Uh, Bette Midler made her Broadway debut, taking over as one of Tevye's daughters in the original run of Fiddler on the Roof. It is so sad that because of her health issues, Carol was not able to attend um, that f revival of Dolly. I think she would have loved it. And as much as I think she would have definitely loved Bette Midler, as everyone did, boy, would she have loved uh, Bernadette Peters. Um, and I would also assume she uh, she would have loved Help Me Tuesday Nights was Donna, uh, Donna Murphy. Uh, yes. Donna Murphy, who was delightful in the role. Uh, Carol's final years, her health. Wait, before you go, before you go, I mean, we're, we're not, not going, right? before you go, no, you're done. We're <laughs> just going to finish your life. Who, and then back. who do you, th who is your favorite Dolly? Cause you've seen them. You've seen them all, but the one I'll who gonna I give you hear, mine in a second. But... The one who I hear in my head when I think of lines from the show will always be Carol because I saw her, I saw her do the show about two dozen times. So it's in my head. But I will tell you, honestly, the best Dolly I ever saw was Bernadette. I think she was that amazing. Um, Bernadette is also the only widow who ever played Dolly on Broadway. Uh, and I think that brought a dimension to what she did because her widowhood was not over-dramatized. It was not, uh, you know, sentimentalized. It was there and it was genuine. When she, who lost, uh, Bernadette, you may remember, lost her, lost husband, her husband in a, a in, horrible in, helicopter accident. In a horrible helicopter accident during the war in Serbia. He was there uh, doing some good work and he was blown to pieces. When she stopped in the middle of everything and said, Ephraim, let me go. It's been long enough, Ephraim. She was not acting. It was genuine. It was beautiful. It was heartbreaking every time. I saw her do it four times and I wish I'd seen her 40 more. Uh, I wish Carol had seen it at all. She passed away January 15th, 2019 at the age of 97. What a wonderful, wonderful life she had. Uh, she died loved. She died knowing that she was loved. And she died leaving behind a legacy of laughter. I want to share two clips that I think you'll enjoy, Bill. These are from uh, Carol's One Woman Club Act. Um, they're memories of two of the people who she had the joy of knowing during her incredible career. And you know where the job was? Uh, Mr. Lastfogel said... All right, oh. behave. All right, this may be a misbehaving clip. See, the other one was fine. Sent me to Las Vegas where I met my... All right, it's not behaving, so I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, we have this problem, folks. We apologize. She tells this marvelous story uh, that when she was booked in Las Vegas for the first time, she became friendly with Sophie Tucker. Now, those who know Bette Midler know about Sophie Tucker. She was a very, you know, generously proportioned woman who had been uh, one of the great stars of vaudeville. And she was famous for telling body jokes, uh, and so there she is giving to my boyfriend, Ernie, about her boyfriend, Ernie. Yes, I'm not going to do any of them now. They're a little too racy, but oh, please. <laughs> oh, well, maybe later. Uh, but she's doing, uh, you know, she's giving Carol advice on how to handle crowds in Las Vegas, which are very different from audiences in New York. When you're in the casino, Carol, don't bother trying to dress sexy. Believe me, baby. To a, to, a, uh, to a gambler, a low-cut dress is just another place to lose the dice. <laughs> I said, Miss Tucker, did you ever lose dice down there? She said, I not only lost the dice, I lost the stick man trying to get them out. Uh, now, that's Carol, but that's the kind of fun she would have. 
We'll try one other brief clip and see if the man is fortunate enough. Nope, nope. It's just not. It's first. Isn't that bizarre? The ones some do, some don't. So here, folks, is yet another story. Now, this one I can tell personally because not only did I know and love Carol, but I got to meet Tallulah Bankhead, and we should do an episode on her one night. That would be fun. Um, Tallulah Bankhead came to visit her during the first week of Hello Dolly, and and Channing said to her, oh, Tallulah, I'm just so sorry. I'm I'm not my usual self. We've been working so hard to get this show together. I haven't had a, a good night's sleep in weeks. And Tallulah said to her, Well, I'll take the sleeping pill. <laughs> And I, I, I said, oh, no, Tallulah, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't like doing any of that kind of stuff. It can be habit form. It can be addictive. Tallulah said, don't be ridiculous. They're not addictive. I've been taking them every night for 36 years. They're not addictive. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe absolutely that Tallulah said that. Absolute belief. Um, now, don't go. So tell no, me, no. I want two little stories quick. What did sure. Carol Channing do when she learned that Barbara Streisand, who was very good in the role, uh, when she learned that Barbara Streisand was going to play her part? Well, there are many legends about that. But there's one line that I, I'm not sure, of, but I'm pretty sure. And if you don't do it, I'll just say what it was. You do it. You do it. Oh, I can't do her voice, but I, I think. I was so excited that I that I was so pleased that I just I praised or something like that. And I opened my window and jumped out. Yeah. <laughs> That's something she might have said. Um, I do know that on one occasion when she was in a particular mood, she said, oh, yes, dear old B.J. Streisand. <laughs> and she just let that sit. Now, for those who do not know, Barbara Streisand's middle name is Joan, so she is B.J. Streisand. But she said, and some people wonder. Oddly, my name is B.J. She wondered how she got that role. Well, just ask B.J. Stop. Uh, just, she was very she, good in it. She was very Barbara good. Barbara Streisand was good. But listen, Carol Channing had the right to be annoyed that the role yes, of, of a lifetime went to someone her. else. Okay. And, um, John, what's the corn story? Oh, you are God, welcome, you America. Hear that? That is the most terrible story. For many years, Carol You're welcome, America. was macrobiotic, which is a very careful way of eating. You literally keep track of every ingredient that goes into your body when you're on a macrobiotic person. This is so good. When, when I was working at the Russian Tea Room as assistant to the maitre d', she would come in with these beautiful silver cases. Made Her own version of Tupperware. Well, yeah. it, they, they were more like thermoses. They were thermal cases <clears throat> covered in silver made at Tiffany's for her with her initials and everything. And when she sat down, all the people at her table would order lovely meals, including her husband, uh, Mr. Mr. Lowe, who was very nice to me, by the way. I always liked him. Uh, and whenever the waiter would say, and you, Miss Channing, and she would always answer the same thing. Oh, nothing for me, dear. Just a glass of water and a warm plate. And the warm plate would come and she would dish out her macrobiotic food and everybody else would be having their brozhniki, the rozolnik, you know, all the Russian dishes that are very rich and beautiful. And she'd be having this lovely, super healthy food. Well, according to legend, one day a woman is sitting in a stall at the Waldorf in the ladies room. And she's sitting there and a very unmistakable voice from the next stall. Says, Wait, stop. Just before you finish the line, I thought this happened during a show. No, this happened oh. supposedly in a ladies room. Okay, go on. Right? It'd be more well, funny so, if it was during a show and her no, mic was on. I heard the yeah, mic well, that, was on. Now that's bull because she never would have done that. She never would okay. have done that. Okay. I'll tell you a story along those know. lines in a second. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but Carol Channing did supposedly say, corn? When did I eat corn? Now, as you get older, yeah, I interrupted you. So she's in a stall yes. and the woman next to her. That's, that's unthinkable. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe, I think that story is apocryphal. I will tell you a story that is true. During the last run of Hello, Dolly, one of the cast members, one of the guys, uh, was dealing with heavy medication because he was dealing with AIDS. Oh, this is a nice and story. And he did not wish to miss performances because he could wind up getting fired. Um, so he was showing up. Now, keep in mind, Carol Channing inspired all the people who worked with her. This woman gave over 4,500 to 5,000 performances, depending who who's counting. On Didn't miss much. Stages. She never had an understudy or standby go on in all those 
years. Wasn't there some like little half a show or something weird or something like that? Like right? something partial, which she explains yes. in her book. She never really missed an evening. Um, so others would try to, you know, and, and that inspired the younger people in her productions. So this guy doesn't want to miss a show. Well, in the middle of one number, he has an accident on stage in front of the audience and no one can tell who it is, but there's clearly effluvia on the stage. And of course, in Hello, Dolly, which is a very heavily choreographed show that can be dangerous. They had to momentarily close the curtain and have the stage cleared and say, ladies and gentlemen, there's a minor technical problem. Please be stay in your seats. We will resume momentarily. Meanwhile, they're ready to kill someone, ready to kill someone. Before anything could happen, Carol went to the stage manager and said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I had a little accident on stage. Please forgive me. I, I'm, I promise you it'll never happen again. It was not her. There's no way it was her. Carol was never sick on stage in her life. She did that to save this guy from what could have been professional annihilation. That's the class act Carol Channing was. Um, and she deserves a lot of, of credit for that. Now, when I took you to see her back in 78, we sat right up front, didn't we? Uh, I must admit, I don't, we weren't, we certainly weren't in the front row. I do remember right. our story is famous is that we were uh, like not halfway there, but John discovered that he had forgotten the tickets. Yep. And we, got them, go we got there. We got there, uh, but uh, I don't remember we were front row, but it certainly was close. Not front row, but right up front. We were like yep. in the second or third row and, uh, you liked it. But like you said, you were not loving it. I was in love with the show. I had seen her do it before. I had seen Pearl Bailey do it before. Um, I like Donna Theodore, too. Remember, uh, I, I had a crush on her, and I'm gay, so I have no idea what that was about. She played uh, Ribbons Down My Back. She played her. No. Donna wasn't Theodore? Donna Theodore? No, that was not Donna Theodore. Who the hell was it? Uh, in that production, it was the same person who did it in uh, the 1980s production um, she was uh, Jerry Herman's protege. Uh, she starred in Grand Hotel. Uh, if 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 Bill's staff is on, please check with them. Uh, Mr. G, I did not say effluvia. I said effluvia. Effluvia, which means human excrement. Okay, there. Thank you, Mr. G. It's, it has extra syllables, and Mr. G has trouble with. These are big words. Yes, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the actresses. Doesn't name. matter. Go on, go on, go on. Doesn't matter. She was also the best Evita I saw on Broadway. She took over after she was one of the later Evitas on Broadway. Uh, but anyway, uh, I loved that production. I was so thrilled with it. Um, and there you were, <laughs> Mr. G said, Oh, thank you. Be well, sir. Um, back to what we were discussing. Um, anyway. And at the end of the show, when I stood and cheered, you were kind of looking at me like, "Really? That oh, uh, see, I don't don't remember that. I mean, right I thought it, it was like, very eh. good, but they like, ended eh. up too. Yeah, you were like, eh. um, and, and like, okay, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, but oh, now I should tell you, I took my then boyfriend, uh, to see it, uh, who was in college with us. He was, uh. He had been a senior when we were freshmen and I took him to see the show. He was a big opera fan. All right. He was also your, a seminary at the time. At the, major seminary. the seminary, but go yes. on. Yes. We were in the college. He, we were at the college seminary. He was in the major seminary. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to see this and, and we got, you know, half price tickets to it. And at the end of the show, I said, well, what did you think of it? And he said, well, I can see why they like Channing so much, but my God, she could have lifted her dress and taken a dump and the audience still would have liked it just as much. I was like, oh, it's a recurring okay. theme here. I was like, <laughs> well, who am I going to take to the show? Who's who's going to enjoy it? You know, as half heartedly as these two. I did um, like it. I just, <laughs> I just. I am going to look up. I still think it was Donna Theodore, but that's okay. We'll we'll do our research. Okay, I've been right sometimes, and I can yes, just look up can. there and get it, but I can't. Yes, because, you can be. Um, <laughs> um, 
Now, is that the only time you ever saw her on on stage? You know, I honestly, I, I'm gonna say, did I see, did I see Hello Dolly again? And there's part of me thinking that I did, but I do not remember because I'm thinking that whatever I saw, this isn't me being unkind. It's just that when she raised her arms, I remember thinking, "Ooh, she's getting older," and I didn't think that was in that particular performance. So I think I did see it again, but I don't. It remember. is funny when we saw her do Dolly. She was younger than either Midler or Bernadette Peters would wow. be when they did Dolly. But you and I thought of her as old because yeah. we were so young. In the original run of Dolly, the whole, every actress of a certain age wound up taking on the role, including Mary Martin, Ethel Merman, Dorothy, uh, Dorothy L'Amour, uh, Eve Arden did it on national tour. Um, Ginger they Rogers. Were all, they were all in their 50s. They were in their 50s. Now, to find someone who's powerful enough to play Dolly, we had to go with actresses who turned 70 while they were doing the show uh, two and a half, three years ago. Um, it, it's a pity that Liza didn't do it when she was still up to it. I think she would have made a fine Dolly. And you know I what? don't know. I can't picture that. When I'm, I'm not being mean. It, I, I don't a know. a comedian, it would have worked. The know. one who wants to play Dolly and who still hasn't, and frankly, she is the right age now, is Kristen Chenoweth. I, I was hoping that she would get a shot at playing it. Uh, and, and frankly, I was also hoping that Queen Latifah would take a shot. I think she would be a sensational Dolly. And Lord knows she can handle the comedy as well as the music. Um, um, but there, I think. Uh, now, did, did you want to cover some of the news? No, we did. Oh, oh switch topic. Okay, so yes, sorry. There's been some stuff going on in theater since Tony night. Okay. All right. Hold on. Got to get the paperwork for all this one. I'll barrel through them because there's really one that you and I both want to talk about. Dear Evan Hansen did poor at the box office. The critics gave it a poor, um, they just didn't like it, but so like a 39 on Rotten Tomatoes, but audiences do like it. Unfortunately, they're not going. So it is a probably considered a flop, although you never know. It's a little early, but uh, John and I did see it. That was one of our shows. And while I liked it more than he did, John didn't hate it. Uh, he it's it going to rely on on video to pay off the debts. Right. Yeah. Um, Diana, which is a musical that is due to open. This is very strange and we're kind of living in a new world now where this kind of thing is happening. Diana, which will be opening, I don't know, I, I think November or early December. It is starts going, previews in October. Oh, there you go. Is going to be on Netflix, the Broadway show, the cast, this Friday. I don't understand, are, but there you go. So you can see the show for free, although, I, of course, it is a recording, but there you go. It was either the, the, the director or one of the producers who said in an interview, it did. It, they don't believe that Hamilton will suffer for being on Disney, and they don't believe that they will suffer for being on Netflix. This is the winter of Princess Diana. Not only will she have a musical on Broadway, they will be the film Spencer, which is a lavish retelling of Do Diana's yes. uh, life. And there's also going to be the, the next the season of The Crown, yes. which will involve her um, in, in involve, you know, the end of her time as 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 wife of Charles and will probably include her death. Now, since The Crown is also produced uh, and created by the team behind the movie The Queen, I wonder how much of the, of that ground they're going to cover a second time and how they'll do it differently. There's lots of possibilities, but yeah. we'll, we'll see. Um, um, tick, tick, boom, uh, which is it's the uh, about the who is the uh, writer of Jonathan writer Larson. Larson. Jonathan Larson, I know it. that I'm trying to get you in here. Um, is he did another musical which is kind of about his own life, mm -hmm. and it was off Broadway. I did see it, I didn't see it with the original, I don't remember who the original was. I saw it with uh, original, uh, original was Jonathan Larson off, uh, off Broadway when oh, I opened okay. up off Broadway after Rent and after Jonathan was done, it was different. Okay, I had one of the uh, not the Backstreet Boys, one of the who was the first boy group that uh, the, uh from Boston. Uh, uh, right, I had him, and he's yeah. very good. Uh, anyway, it's going to be directed by Lynn Manuel um, Miranda. Andrew Garfield is the lead. Uh, Vanessa Hudgens, Alexandra Ship, Robin this is David the movie version. We should tell people it's for the it's for the screen. Uh, Joshua Henry, Judith Light, Bradley Woodford, and that is November 10th. Um, I, you know, that's one of those things where that'll be interesting. I have a feeling people will not be lined up, but um, I'm kind of excited and it's kind of interesting to see. Um, so, I can't you know. pretend I'm excited. But. Right. But, uh, you know, I want to see it. It might be better than the play was. Who knows? Right. At least they're now. I like the play, kind now, of. Now, here's an interesting thing. In the play, 
He's not he necessarily in, in the play. It's not clear who it is, who is the main character for the movie. They're saying he's playing Jonathan Larson. He is, right. It's going to be sort of his. Um, there's a great number. Uh, I, I don't have the title, but I think it's Sunday brunch or something like that, where it doesn't make fun. It gives tribute to Stephen Sondheim and Sunday. It's quite lengthy. It's quite long. And it's quite uh, it's really very nice. It's, it's really Sondheim, an OK show. I, I remember he, he it. And Sondheim good. adored each other. So, yeah, right. um, slave play is going that oh slave play was i thought it was going to win i did not see it but i thought it was going to win best play because everybody said slave play is it going only to win, win best revival which i think is uh, right no no, Wait, sorry, no no it was up for best play and it was up I'm for everything. about the army play sorry yeah it, it had the most nominations but it didn't get a single one it is going to be returning uh on november 23rd to january 23rd and i remember saying to both my husband and to you john gee i would have liked especially when i thought it was going to win i would have liked to have seen it so the two things i want to say is not putting you on the spot jonathan uh, john but you know i would like to see it and it'd be a nice tkts kind of thing because what was all the talk about and yeah. so i would like to see it i don't say the same, same thing to my husband but what i immediately think the minute i hear of any show now coming back for a limited run is oh I bet they're going to film it. <clears throat> so um, I don't want to jump on that. Let's see what happens. But I really would like to see it because yeah. um, all those nominations, yeah. and even though it didn't win, it still had all those nominations. And that usually does mean there's something in yeah. there to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. The next one, we have limited time. It's eight. Do you want me to start it? Do we want to save Go this ahead. for another one? Go okay. Ahead. The Tony Awards. The first thing I want to say is those of you who saw us do the Tony Awards episode, we uh, started to tape our live our version of it as the show was still on so both of us did not get and to see on, the end and on and on did not get to see the end and um unfortunately or fortunately depending on point of view the end was actually quite good it was the, the best they part had, of the show it was the duets um the duet from wicked was okay we've seen that many times it was it was lovely but then came uh rent, rent. uh and i thought that was rather good and, and they both looked good shut up john but then rent. Then, oh, sorry, yes. then we got Audra McDonald and Brian Stokes Mitchell. Now, this is the second dream. time uh, uh, Stokes had been on that night because he had already done the memoriam when he did To Dream the Impossible Dream. Mm -hmm. But they did Wheels of a Dream. I guess it was a dream night for him. Yeah. Man, oh man. I mean, he didn't do well. Now, he yeah. blew it blew out, out of the, the yeah, he did. building. He but was amazing. The thing. Nobody was watching. Right. Well, we're going to talk about stop talk. Let me finish. <clears throat> I'll get to that. <clears throat> then right after it was um, a rap that I kind of enjoyed because I didn't think I would. It was that freestyle love thing. And I thought, oh, do I really, you know, what is that? In fact, they improv on the evening. They, right. They, but they, they, they improv on the evening and it was actually quite entertaining. OK, yeah. now, John, just zip it and give me a second here. So it turns out good boy, that the ratings for this Tony's, shocking, were 51% down from past years. Keep it covered, John. Let me get through this to begin with because I have a lot to say. Well, why was it 51% down? Well, do you think, now John will have a little section here where he where he's stuffing his mouth, where he's going to want to say, well, we shouldn't have had a Tony Awards in the first place because we didn't have a season and i'm going to say well we kind of did and what really what matters here is that we yes honor the work that was done but we also need to bring the money in we need to promote the theater so what did cbs do they moved two hours of this show to Paramount Plus that none of us could actually see, even though I was signed up for it, but I couldn't figure out, we couldn't figure out how to get onto it, even though we were on it, but they wouldn't allow people who got it through Amazon to if go see it. If only two and a half million people, according to the ratings, were watching the CBS, CBS version. Can you imagine how pathetic the ratings were on for that particular Paramount now, Plus? I thing. really love my award shows. It just is what I do. The pandemic took a lot Lot away from me including body parts and so i wanted to see my award shows the oscars yeah. was in a train station the emmys was under a tent and so what did they do to my tonys they put it on a channel that nobody could see and then on cbs they gave us three of the awards and a lot of little musical numbers yeah well you know what cbs and the the, the tony award committee i have a few thoughts to say what were you thinking were you really, what were you promoting? What were you trying to get out of this? 
because you certainly weren't pushing the show pushing the shows well i mean this is just ridiculous and so therefore if your rating sucked it's for two reasons you stupidly put this on once again sunday night up against sports and all which always rates higher and you didn't promote the show very well and of course nobody watched and did you really have any reason to draw them in i mean i swear to god you should have gotten that korean boy group and i can't remember the name of them btl or whatever it is and they could have sung Kuna Matata, and they people would have watched, and you could have gotten Madonna, and she could have frounced around with her Matatas, Ooh, and at least people oh no. would have watched. But nobody was watching. So I have a few thoughts. A, think about the business, not yourself. How about you just don't do it anymore and let PBS do it? There's a thought, or maybe some other channel, or maybe Netflix, since they're bothering to pick. pick put all these musicals on maybe they could do it or maybe not have it on sunday night here's a thought have it on saturday night or friday night because your ratings suck on those nights anyway so probably the tony awards would do better same thing with pbs what you're going to have another murder mystery that night have the tony awards instead i bet your ratings would be higher you know to all what of you gave the tony's higher ratings the year hamilton was on something exciting was happening this year, you know what exciting thing happened in on Broadway? It shut down for 18 months. The shutdown was the most exciting part of the last two years. You do not pretend that half a season is a season. You don't pretend that when you have no musicals with original songs that you can give out a best score award. That was an insult. Uh, this whole Tony's was a farce. Shame on the American theater wing and on all involved for going through with this nonsense. This wasn't a cheering se session for Broadway. This wasn't, you know, a homecoming uh, or a reunion. This was a sad funeral. It was <laughs> embarrassing. It was I'm glad they had it. They just could have done a better job. <laughs> it was embarrassing as a show. Um, all those four even, nominees that didn't get seen, they win and nobody gets to see them. I, I would love to know what the ratings were on Paramount Plus. I want to you, know you why spend your whole life trying to win an to award and you win it. Until the show was over to have the best part of the show. Who the hell made that decision with two hours on Paramount Plus that they could have put so much of that crap into? Um, was it really necessary to have these other duets that were so tedious? They didn't need to be there. They didn't. I'm sorry. It's one thing. It is one thing when Ben Platt's father puts him in a vanity production movie, which is one of the worst movie musicals in modern times. Oh, it's it is garbage. not. Yes, it is. It and is not. Don't believe me. Go look at some of the other reviews that are on. Yeah, YouTube. the reviewing. The reviews are horrible. The reviews are horrible because the movie is horrible. But the audience well, is liked it. Now, 93 rating. At the Tony Awards, anxious to continue pretending Ben Platt is more than he ever has been or ever will be. They had him singing Sondheim. Ben Platt singing Sondheim Smiling. makes about as much sense as having Liberace uh, as your uh, quarterback at the Super Bowl. It was completely wrong. It just, it wasn't even funny. It was sad. Um, Cranky Squirrel is asking, is this the part where we all get up and go to the window and scream, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore? Uh, maybe it is cr Cranky Squirrel. Oh, look at that. You to have which, a thing that makes the quote come yes, up on the screen. To which that's Mr. new. G says, LOL. Oh, don't um, encourage Mr. Yes. G. But yes, right. that's very good, Cranky Squirrel. But yes, Cranky Squirrel. <laughs> I am mad as hell, and I'm. I don't want to take this kind of Tonys anymore. This was sad, and you know what? Without yelling or screaming, the American public said, "We don't give a shit. We don't give a rat's patootie about these Tonys." And what I'm afraid is that we're not going to get to see them. And here's what I want to add: this one more thing. So here we are pushing really hard and it's going to happen so now we're going to have a more not a diverse cast that's not what they're really looking for of course that's usually pretty much given anyway they want right. diversity in the the uh creation and the producing and everything behind the scenes or and that which is the art include from makeup to the to all the crafts okay right. well if you continue doing this then when those people are nominated and win well we're but not no going to see watching. them 
We're not going to see them. No. So therefore, little little boys and girls across the country are going to have no idea that when, you could uh, become the designer of a Broadway set. And not, well, it doesn't matter because no one's going to see them. We even with the mask on, we didn't see them. But we didn't even see the winners this year, barely, if unless you were on that channel. The, uh, the original Tony Awards were never televised until the early 1960s. Well, okay, but that was, you know. They were televised in the early 1960s first. Uh, and it was a event Gathering. in the Waldorf yeah. Ballroom. And people got up to accept awards. Some and amazing they, winners, by the way. Oh, yeah. Richard <laughs> Rogers was the first one to accept. Uh, Helen Hayes. And uh, it just goes on and on. Mr. G is saying this should have been a two hour commercial for Broadway. Correct. And instead it wound up being a two hour mess, a four hour mess. Really? If you count the whole thing. This is he talking about us or the, or the Tony awards? No, the Tony awards should have been a two hour. I'm, I'm sure. Mr. Of course, G that's what it's Tony supposed to be. Or even, had, they had four hours to do something with it and, and they just didn't do it because nobody watched. You know what? You need a strong producer on this show who can look at people and say, no, that's what Broadway runs on. That's what film runs on. Someone has to be there to say no. There was no one there to look at the moron who directed Dear Evan Hansen, who had no clue what he was doing and say no. There were people who looked at the director of In the Heights and occasionally said no, do this differently. And the result was a damned entertaining movie. I thought a fine entertain, first rate entertaining movie. Um, that deserves more credit than most people gave it. But back to where we are. Uh, were there any other news stories we needed to cover? No, I saved that one for last because I All knew right. we would go off the rails. All right. So since we now, like the Tonys, have gone more than 10 minutes over time, I think this is a beautiful place to say we end today's uh, telecast. Now, uh, we're First, going wait, to... Oh, I have something to say. Um, yeah. Someone has a birthday coming up this week, oh. and that would be you, John. <clears throat> Very soon. Happy birthday. He is Thank the you. same age as I, I turned uh, my age before he did. So we're both going to be our age, our age. soon. Very soon. But happy birthday, John. Thank you, my so my old, old, older friend. Thank you. <laughs> you bitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a matter of months, please. Um. Uh, thank you, Mr. G, who said, great show, funny stories. Glad that you enjoyed it. We are glad to have you there. Uh, anyone who spent uh, this hour with us, thank hour and, and 15 minutes. Thank you so much. You could have been watching anything and doing anything tonight, and you spent some time with us. Appreciate you being here. Uh, we're off this Thursday because I have a speaking engagement on Long Island and Queens. Uh, and Which I'm attending. And, right. <laughs> and next Thursday, I'm we're going to have as our special guest, Bill, please explain. Sandy Nice Brunel. The reason I'm laughing is this. I can't. I'll explain at some other point. But anyway, she is my classmate from school. So while we've been it might be one of the last ones we do, but we've been interviewing uh, th uh, 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 actors in the business, including we me, who have not been working. Do. Uh, but uh, she has been working. And so uh, I am really looking forward to that interview because she is one of my nearest and dearest. So I'm that'll be next week. To it too. Folks, thank you for watching and stay well. Do everything you can to keep yourself healthy. And Mr. G, we are not 80. Just, oh, <laughs> again. <laughs> He's not suggesting that. Yes, well, um, I know Mr. G, and one day we're going to discuss him on the air. Well, and maybe we'll it's have him going to be guess. good. What the hell? Stranger things have happened. Mm -hmm. Everyone, thank you so much, and keep loving musicals. Good night. <laughs>